everybody. Good to have you in service today on this Mother's Day. We are in part number three of a four-part message series. I'll tell you more about that here in just a second. First of all, as always, I want to say a big shout out to all of our church online family. You're watching us from all over America and around the world. And can we give a big warm welcome to all the guys and gals in 109 Department of Corrections. Come on, everybody. Make them feel welcome today. God bless you. Hey, um, as you are sharing this message out on social media uh, and pulling up the message notes, let me just say that we've been hearing fantastic responses from, from both men and women of how this series has really been impacting lives. And I'm just going to encourage you to be back next week because next week is probably going to be my favorite message of this entire series. And so let's pick up where we left off last week. You guys remember this, that Samson at this point had killed a thousand men. He is now in the desert. He is uh, public enemy number one of all of the Philistines. They want to assassinate him, take him out. He is parched. He is thirsty. And he cries out to God. And it says here in chapter 15, verse 19, that God opened up the hollow place and water came out. And when Samson drank, what happened to everybody? Strength returned, and he revived. And I just want to remind you today that when you return back to God, your strength will return. You will be revived. Yeah. So the spring was called en Hakor, and it's still there. And Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Now, let me pause for a moment here so that you don't skirt by this very important detail. In fact, this may be the first good news that we've heard all throughout this story. And that is that we see 20 years of apparent faithfulness to God. I mean, that's amazing to me that we see this taking place. The tragedy, though, is that Samson, like so many men, when he's serving God and honoring God and doing the right things, after 20 years, he begins to do the wrong things, begins to make bad decisions, poor choices, and we see his entire life begin to spiral into a self-destruct mode to the point we find at the end of his life his eyes gouged out and he is now the laughing stock of his enemies. Which really brings me to the question of the day and that's this. How could a man with so much God-given potential mess his life up so badly? And I think the answer to that question is really the main thought, the key thought of the day and it's this, that Samson didn't ruin his life all at once. He ruined it one step at a time. And you need to know, men, that you don't ruin your life all in one moment. You ruin, you ruin it one step at a time. In fact, let's see this here play out in Samson's life. It says in chapter 16, verse 1. So just remember, we just saw 20 years of faithfulness. And it says, one day. Come on, everybody, say one day with me. One day, Samson went to Gaza, where there he saw a prostitute. So stop. <laughs> Wait just one second. 20 years of faithfulness, and then boom. Like, it's interesting to me how somebody could be walking with God, serving God, doing the right thing, and then just begin to make wrong decision after wrong decision that self-destructs their life. And we're going to see that play out in Samson's world. He went there to spend the night with her, and the people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place, and they lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn, we're going to kill him. Now, the significance of this point, of him going to Gaza, is this, that Gaza was the headquarters of the Philistines, so we're going to watch our idiot, Samson, <laughs> leave his home, travel 25 miles into enemy territory, go to the headquarters of enemy territory into Gaza to pursue a prostitute and risk 20 years of faithfulness, which really causes us to think, why would somebody be so stupid 
to risk 20 years of faithfulness. Why would somebody be willing to risk so much for so little? And the answer is, is that men do it all the time. They, they, they do it all the time, every single day. There's guys that say, well, I have a good marriage and I've got a good integrity, I've got a good name, I've got a good, I've got a good family, I've got good kids, I've got a good job, I've got all, all these good things. And yet, they take what is good and they risk it for a quick sexual high. They risk it for some kind of sexual experience or some kind of, some kind of other kind of high or some kind of other experience that is out there. Like, why would someone be so stupid to risk so much? for something so little. And the reality is, is that men do it all the time. So I want you to think about something. I mean, you guys know that as a pastor, I only work one day a week, right? (laughs) Actually, no, I'm working two days a week. I'm working Saturday and Sundays, and, and I'm joking, all right? But since I'm a pastor, you guys know that the only thing I ever do is I just read my Bible and I hover over my desk, okay? what I do all day long. Uh, But I started thinking about this. Samson went 25 miles from his home to where Delilah was at in Gaza in enemy territory. That was a 25-mile journey. I started thinking, how many steps does it take to walk 25 miles? I did some research, and this is what I found out. It takes 56,250 steps to walk 25 miles. So think about this. How do most men ruin their lives? They don't do it in one moment. They do it step by step by step. How did Samson ruin his life? He did it step by step. 56,250 opportunities he had to turn around. 56,250 chances to say, I'm going the wrong way. Don't do this. This is not right. But he ruined his life one step at a time. See, the problem with with guys is that no man ever decides to mess their life up. I've never met a guy that said, you know, my five-year goal is to become a raging porn addict. That's my goal. I'm going to be so hooked into a fantasy world, get my jollies off of that, that I have no idea how to even relate to my wife uh, sexually in intimacy, in an intimate experience at all. No man ever says that. But one click, after another click, after another click, we find our lives going down a deep, dark tunnel. Because you don't ruin your life in one moment. You ruin it one step after another step. Like I've never met a man that said, hey, you know what? I'd like to be just broke. I want to be massively broke. Embarrassingly broke, mad broke. I've never met a man that's ever said that. But then there's scores of men all the time that say, you know what, I, I can get the house and I can get the cars and I can get the boat and I can get the, 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 the rod and reel and I know I can get those golf clubs too and I can do the gambling and I know what I'm gonna do. I, I'm, I'm gonna do multi-level marketing. That's gonna get me out of debt. I'm gonna start a business even though I know nothing about business. <laughs> and one day they, make, they wake up in massive trouble. Or I've never met a guy that said, you know what, I've got a good life and a good marriage and a good kids and I've got a good job and a good name. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go go have an affair. That's what I'm going to go do. No man ever says that. And you know that it just doesn't, you don't want to just wait. I I have no idea how it happened. I just fell into her bed one day. It doesn't happen like that. Watch, watch. this is how, I've been doing this all weekend, everybody. Watch this. Come on. Y'all, y'all, come on. Come with me here on this. Here's how it happens. Watch this. It's a little, oh, she's cute, cute. A little flirt, flirt, a little wink, wink, a little text, text, a little touch, touch, and step by step by step. We ruin our lives. Men don't ruin their lives all at once. They ruin it one step at a time. And I want to show today both men and women how Samson's small steps led to disastrous results in his life. And here's the first thing that I want to show you. Number one, Samson, Samson taunted his enemy. So I'm going to want you to see here as he taunts the Philistines, his enemies. Look at this. It says, but Samson lay there. So he's, he's shacking up with his user-friendly girlfriend, 
Y'all like that? <laughs> I like you guys. You guys are great. We're going to have fun today. Only until the middle of the night, and then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate, and together with the two posts, he tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them up to his shoulders, and he carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now, here's what I need you to know. These were not hollow core doors. Historians tell us that they were about 700 pounds. And when he ripped them off, it was as if he was flipping off the Philistines. Because in those days, the gates symbolized security. And what he was declaring to everybody is, ain't none of y'all safe when I'm around. Because as long as I'm here, y'all better watch it. Because I'm taking your security and I'm holding it captive. Samson took the gate of the city, ripped it off of his hinges, I mean, took it and held it up to his shoulders, marched up a hill and slammed it into the mountainside. That's a lot like what it looks like when I work out. Um, And y'all don't have to laugh so hard at that one, all right? (laughs) But the dude was strong. Like he was really, really strong. And he taunted the enemies. And guys, here's what happens We forget and we underestimate that you have an enemy. You underestimate the fact that he wants to kill, steal, and destroy everything that matters to the heart of God. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Peter, it says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And I need you to know, men, that your spiritual enemy, Satan, doesn't want to just wound you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to devour you. Now, if you're new around here, you would need to know what general family does the lion belong to? It's the cat family, okay? Cat family. You need to know that. So let me just educate you, okay? Let me just watch this. Cats, Satan, lions. You guys see the correlation of all that? Huh? You guys, you guys picking that up? Okay. So just, just want, you, want you guys to know that. But let me, let me go on the record and just say this, okay? Because I've been, you know, some of you guys have, uh, you've been complaining about my cat jokes recently. And so let me just remind you, these are jokes, okay? These are jokes. Uh, that, 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 that's what they are. In fact, you would need to know that uh, I've actually had two cats growing up. Two cats. Yeah. Not because I like cats, <laughs> but because the people that I love thought that I should have a cat. So I hate cats, but, but I love the people that gave the cats to me. And so the first one was my mom and dad. They gave me a cat. I called her Muffin. She was decent. Decent as a cat, if, if, if a cat can be decent. And then the other one came from Tatum. We were dating. She gave me a cat. I called her Blackie. And Blackie was a bad cat. Real bad cat. Um, she almost destroyed our relationship. Uh, so I've, ha- I've, had, I've had a cat. Hello, my name is Chris. And I, I've had a cat. And I don't know about you, but he, this, this cat, Blackie, what, cat, what, what this cat, Blackie, would do is that Blackie would jump up on the counter, which is disgusting to me because that's where people eat food. And she would jump up on that counter. When she would do that, I would taunt the enemy. I would look at her and I'd say, Blackie, you're not supposed to be up here. And then I would grab some food. I'd put it in my mouth and I'd say, mm, mm, mm. So one day, Blackie jumped up on the counter, the place that she's not supposed to go because that's disgusting because that's where we eat food. And I grabbed some, and I put it in my mouth. I said, mmm, Blackie, this is so good. Blackie took her little paw and slapped me in the face. So there, there's your justice, you, you lovely cat lovers that are out there. Uh, I got slapped in the face by Blackie. 
And I don't know why I told you that, but it's good to get that off my chest. (laughs) See, here's the point. Here's the thing I want you to see, and that's this. So oftentimes, we underestimate, we underestimate our spiritual enemy. And we put ourselves in stupid places of temptation. Stupid. So maybe you're a guy and you're wanting to remain sexually uh, sexually pure, but you, yet you keep going to stupid places. Or maybe you're, you're a young man and you want to keep yourself sexually pure for the woman that you're going to marry someday, and yet someday you get a girlfriend and you think, ah, you can just spend the night at my house. What are you doing? That's stupid. That's putting yourself, you are taunting the enemy. Or maybe you're a business owner or a businessman and you go off on a business trip and everyone afterwards says, hey, everyone, let's go get some drinks. And you think, man, I can handle it. I'm tough. I got this. One drink after another, after another, after another. And now you're surrounded by all kinds of women. What are you doing? You're putting yourself, you're taunting the enemy. You're putting yourself in a stupid place. Or maybe you're in debt up to your eyeballs. You're strapped and yet you look at your spouse and say, hey, let's go look at the, at the, at the cars. Let's just walk and just see what they have there. What are you doing? You're putting yourself in a stupid place. The Bible says, if you think that you stand firm, be careful Be careful, watch out, that you don't fall. Be careful. The first thing that we find Samson doing is he taunted the enemy. Here's the second thing that he did. Samson rationalized the same old sin. So do you remember how God told Samson, do not go after any woman that worships false gods? Well, he already did it once, and now he's doing it again. In fact, look at this. Verse four. It says, Sometimes, sometime later, he fell in love with a woman of the, in the valley of Sorek, whose name was what? Delilah. Delilah. Like every time I hear her name, I just want to dedicate a love song to somebody out there. <laughs> Delilah. Okay, half of you guys get that joke, and the other half of you are like, what in the world are you talking about? Move on, Chris, move on. So watch this. This is now Samson's third time. Third time. Going after a woman that God said is off limits to him. And we see here that men, listen to me men, we are masters. Masters at rationalizing the same old sin. Oh, it's not a big deal. I'm I'm really a really good guy. There's just this one thing And it's not really that bad, and nobody knows about it, and it really doesn't matter, and it's not hurting anybody. And men, we are masterful at rationalizing the same old sin over and over and over and over again. In fact, let's see Samson do this, okay? It says, the rulers of the Philistines went to Delilah and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength. And how we can overpower him so that we can tie him down and subdue him. So they bribed her. They said, hey, we'll give you a bunch of cash. You go find out the secret. She said, I'm in. So she goes to Samson. I'm not going to read the verses to you. You can read them for yourself. Uh, It's in verses number 6 through verse 14. And she goes to him. And she begins to ask him, give me the secret of your strength. And he lies to her three times. Three times. He says, if you'll bind me up with seven straps, seven cords, I will be as weak as any other man. So she lulls him to sleep. She ties him up. And then Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He wakes up and just breaks right through them with the strength of God. She said, Samson, tell me the secret to your strength. He said, if you'll take new ropes and just wrap them up around me, I will be as weak as any other man. And she lulls him to sleep and does that. And Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He wakes up and breaks right through them. She says, Samson, please tell me the secret of your strength. And this time he gets close to it. He says, it's actually connected to my hair. If you'll just weave fabric into my hair, connect it into this loom, I will be as weak as any mere man. She lulls him to sleep and does that. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He wakes up with the strength. And at that point there, she is frustrated. She's angry. She's like, that is enough. 
Samson, I'm telling you, tell me the secret of your strength. And you're going to have to see what she, what she does next. Watch this. This is crazy. Watch this. She said to him, how can you say, I love you? <laughs> okay. I sound like Miss Piggy when I do that, all right? And I ain't doing it again, all right? You're going to have to watch it back on video, and that'll turn into a meme or something. Uh, all right. How can you say I love you when you won't even confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret to your great strength. Now, ladies, all the ladies in the house, those of you online, to all the ladies that are feeling left out of this message, and you're like, what's the deal? What's the deal, Pastor Chris? You've been bringing the heat to all the guys. Like they've been feeling the wonderful conviction of the Holy Spirit, and we haven't felt anything yet. Come on, are you leaving us out on all of this? I mean, just give it to us. I mean, give us some conviction. And to all of my ladies that are thinking that right now, I dedicate verse number 16 to you. Happy Mother's Day. It says, look at this, with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was what, man? Come on. Can all the men in the house say a big amen? amen. Woohoo! All right, ladies, if the shoe fits, the shoe fits. That's funny. I don't care what you say. That's funny. Watch this. Watch. Samson was strong enough to kill a thousand men. Samson was strong enough to kill a lion with his bare hands. Samson was strong enough to rip a 700-pound door off of its hinges, march up a hill, and slam it into the ground. But he wasn't strong enough to lead a woman. You let that sink in for just a second. Guys, don't you just be strong in business. Don't you just be strong in your area of sports. Don't you just be strong in your hobby. Don't just be strong in your area of expertise. You be strong in the area of influence that God has given to you that you are to lead in. Be a man of God. Rise up, man of God, and be the person that God has called you to be. And all the men and the ladies in the house, come on, say amen. amen. Man, I wish I could run that rabbit trail for a while but I don't have time. Watch what happens next, the very next verse. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I've been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. Do you remember what the Nazarite vow stated? It said that you are to touch no unclean thing, not to drink alcohol, and also to be one that never cuts his hair. He said, if my head was shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. And I love that because here's a moment, a moment where Samson remembers his birth. He remembers the purpose on his life. He remembers the vow that he took to God. And I want to say this because there are scores of men that are listening to me today that you have forgotten who it is that God has called you to be. You have forgotten the man of God that he's called you to be. You have forgotten it. And the Lord wants to remind you of this, that you have not been put on this earth to take up space. You've not been put on this earth to suck air and die. You've not been put on this earth to go to work, pay the bills, and go to sleep. You have not been put on this earth to just do a subpar job. No, there's destiny on your life, sir. There is greatness on your life. You were made and designed by God for a purpose, for a reason. And I'm going to encourage you, rise up, man of God. Rise up and be the man of God that you were called to be, to defend those that cannot defend themselves, to love your brother bride as Christ loves the church, to be a man of courage, a man of strength, a man of honor, a man of integrity. You can be that man. Every, amen, everybody? Amen. You can be that man. I need you to know today that you were made for more than what you've been living for. And Samson has this moment that he remembers back just before he shares the secret. And he tells her, here's my weakness. If you cut my hair, I'll be as weak as anybody else. Verse 19, having been put to sleep on her lap. 
She called a man in to shave off the seven braids of his hair. How many of you all know that's the haircut you'll never forget? And so began to subdue him. And what happened? Strength left him. I wonder how many of us, out of disobedience to God, you're only operating in your own strength. You have no idea what God could do through you in your business. You have no idea the doors of opportunity God would open to you in your career. You have no idea the things that God would want to do in and through you in your, in your marriage and in your, in your home, in your personal well-being. But the problem is, is that you've been doing it all in your own strength because you don't have the strength of God. See, Samson didn't ruin his life all in one moment. He ruined it one, one step at a time. And that's how we ruin our lives. Which brings me to the third thing that we see, and that's this. Samson assumed that his disobedience would never cost him. You know, so many men just assume, ah, I've gotten away with it before. I've talked myself, talked my way out of things before. This isn't going to come back to to haunt me. I, listen, I can get through this. I'm a sharp guy. I know how to work the system. And Samson did not understand that his disobedience would cost him. It says in verse 20, she called, then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he awoke from his sleep. And what did he think? I'll go out just like other times, and I'll shake myself free. I'll shake myself free. It's not going to cost me anything. But what we get is probably one of the saddest verses in the entire Bible. This is a verse that honestly haunts me. It says, but he did not know. He didn't know. Watch me. When the Holy Spirit visits your life, he will always announce himself. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he will always make a grand entrance. When Jesus was baptized, it says that the Holy Spirit, all the, everybody saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. The heavens opened up and God the Father said, this is my son. On the day of Pentecost, uh, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit showed up, it says that there was a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were at. When the Holy Spirit shows up in your life, he always shows up with a great announcement. But when he leaves, you see, the Holy Spirit is so so sensitive he is so sensitive he can be so easily wounded that's why Jesus said one day he said you can say anything you want about me say anything you want about the father your sins will be forgiven but you touch the Holy Spirit you talk blasphemy to him that sin will never be forgiven of you he is so sensitive that when he leaves your life you won't even know. Here's Samson, the man that just always was, God's going to do it, and God's going to do it, and God's going to do it. Disobedience cost him. He did not know that the Lord had left him. He didn't know that things had changed. And men, can I say something to you very humbly today? There may, be a come, there may come a time that you've gotten away with it over and over and over and nobody knows about it and you can explain it away and talk yourself out of it, but there may come a day that she'll look at you and say, that's enough. There may be a day that you've been able to say to your kids, hey, I promise it's going to be different and I promise I'm going to do better and I promise I won't blow up and I promise that I'm going to be what, what I told you that I will be and there may come a day they're going to look at you and say, that's That's enough. There may come a day at your job, you just show up and like, man, I I promise it'll change and I'll do things different. It's not going to be like this. 
that your boss looks at you and says, that's enough. Be sure of this, your sin will find you out. See, here's how the devil operates. He'll tell you, oh, nobody will ever find out about that, and then he'll be the one to turn you in. Samson thought, oh, my disobedience is not going to cost me a single thing. It cost him everything. Because the Lord left. Here's the tragedy. The Philistines, they seized him. They gouged out his eyes. They took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him... They sent him to grind like an animal in the prison. How did a man with so much potential, how did he wind up in such a bad place? I'll tell you how. He didn't ruin his life all at once. He ruined it one step at a time. And for every person that's listening to me right now, I want you to be very real with yourself. I'm not asking you to think about your spouse or the person next to you. I'm wanting you to be very real with yourself because I'm gonna ask you a question. And I want you to answer it for yourself. Guys in the correctional facility, gals in the correctional facility, I want you to grapple with this. Where are you stepping away from God? For some of you, it could be step number one. For others of you, it could be step number 56,249. Where are you stepping away from God? For you, it could be something so simple, like I've just stopped spending time in God's word and in prayer. And even though I'm in church and I volunteer, uh, outwardly, my hair is long. It has the appearance of everything is right. But you know, Your heart is drifted. Or maybe for you, you are locked in a pornographic prison of lust. Or maybe you're locked in another form of lust. Or maybe you have a spirit of entitlement that you think, well, I deserve this. Or maybe you bought into a spirit of pride. I'm strong. I can handle this. How you like me now? Check me out. Look at how strong I am. Look at all the talent I got. Look at how good looking I got. Look at all the money I've got. How you like me now? Or maybe, maybe, just maybe, you're somebody that you've, been, you've bought into and to apathy or anger. Or maybe you are aggressive. You're aggressive in the marketplace. You're aggressive in business. But you won't lead your family in the things of God, the things that you know that you're supposed to lead in the way you're supposed to lead. Maybe it's in the area of your finances that you're supposed to honor God as God wants you to honor him in your your finances. What area of your life have you taken a step away from God in? It could be step one or it could be step number 56,249. And hear me today, you're only as strong as you are honest. Where? Are you stepping away from God? Where? In fact, let me just, let me close this by painting a picture for you and summarizing this the best way that I possibly can. Because today, whether you've walked one step away from God or 56,249, watch this. Look at this. Don't miss this. Where are you stepping away from God? It doesn't matter how many steps you've, turned, you've, you've walked away. Everybody, have the courage to turn around. Turn around. And if you will turn around, you know who will be right behind you? It will be your great God. And he is going to embrace you with his love and his grace and his mercy. But it's your job to turn around. God will not force himself on you. God is a gentleman. He will never force you to turn around. That's your choice. That's your decision. But if you will, he'll embrace you. In fact, I close this message today with the most grace-filled loving thought that comes out of this entire story. Because here was Samson and the outward expression of the inner strength was what? His hair. And he had disobeyed God. He shaved. It was an outward sign of his disobedience to everybody that saw him. He was mocked by all of the Philistines, his enemies. They would throw things at him. They would mock him. He was publicly shamed. 
And yet in that place of what seems like utter despair at the lowest point of a person's life in prison, grinding corn like an animal, I want you to see the most grace-filled, loving words from a God that never gives up. Verse 22, but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Why is that verse there? Because God wants you to know that he never gives up on you. See, the hair was an outward expression of the strength of God that was on the inside. And you need to know today, it doesn't matter how far you've turned away from God, it doesn't matter how far you've walked away from Him, it takes one step back. Turn around. Because men, we don't ruin our lives in one step, in one moment. We do it step after step after step after step. And next week, we're going to learn this truth, that just because a man is down, ha, doesn't mean you're out. No, it doesn't mean you're out at all. See, the devil loves to come and make strong men and make them weak, but God loves to come along and make weak men strong. And he does it all the time. See, we don't ruin our lives in one moment. We we lose it. We ruin it one step at a time. But today, if you would just acknowledge, have I taken a step away from God in any area and have the courage to admit it, to be honest about it, then turn around. You're not going to find a God that's angry at you, calling you what a loser that you are. No, he's going to embrace you. People say, well, I need to get cleaned up first, and then I'll come to God. No, my friend, you can't get cleaned up without first coming to God. God's the one that begins to clean you up. Listen, people look and they say, oh, Chris, they put sometimes they put me on a pedestal that I do not deserve to be on. No man ever needs to be on a pedestal. Listen, we are all in the same hospital, all of us. There's just been some of us that have got here earlier than others. That's the only difference. We're all in the same hospital. We're all working out our salvation. We're all trying to strive to be more like God. We're all trying to move that way. Today's your day that you turn around. Amen, everybody. Amen. Amen. So be it. Come on, do me a favor. Why don't you bow your heads? Lord, Do a work inside of us, I pray. Touch our hearts. Touch our hearts. And today, regardless if you're a man or a woman, I'm not talking about your neighbor. I'm not talking about your spouse or your friend or wherever you're at. What's God speaking to you about? Where where have you found yourself beginning to take steps away from him? Can I remind you, you could be at Delilah's door about to knock. It's not too late. Turn around. Turn around. Don't miss this. So Lord, do a work in all of our hearts, I pray. And if you're here today and you are away from Jesus, this is your moment to surrender everything to him, to give your life to him. And so pray this prayer with me right where you're at. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I turn around. I'm done running. I'm I'm done walking in my own path, and instead I want to walk your path. So forgive me. Change me. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are the son of the living God. I thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer today. And I give you thanks in Jesus' mighty name. Can we just put our hands together and just celebrate the scores of people here and online and in correctional facilities that just went from death to life. And I want you to know I'm so proud of you. And if you prayed that prayer today, if you would, please text Fresh Start to that number there. And we're going to send you some information so that we can journey with you. Praise God for that. Amen. Well, hey, everybody. It's been a great day to have been in God's house, huh? really has been. Now, before I dismiss you, please, just take one second. This is important. Uh, In just a moment, prayer teams are going to be here. We'd love the opportunity to pray. Ways to give are going to be on the screen. And I want to thank you for your generosity and your tithes and your offerings. And I'm thankful. But I'm going to ask you guys to pray for me because next Sunday... I'll be speaking all the Saturday service and then the Sunday services, and then I'm, I'm taking off. 
I'm flying 27 hours <laughs> to, to India, and I will be speaking there in India. We, we have some pastors' conferences that will be speaking to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pastors there. And then on top of that, uh, we're going to be doing miracle services throughout the night. And then on Sunday morning, I think there's seven services at a church there in Chennai. It's about 50,000 people that are in the service there. So y'all pray for me, okay? <laughs> That's, but I'll be speaking there, and then we'll be holding some more miracle services there that night. And I just am praying for the, the touch of God, the, the miraculous touch of God to show on up and to encourage uh, these pastors. We're going to be meeting with the heads of state. Um, it's it's going to be a, it's going to be a powerful time. That'll be a week, and then the next week we fly up to Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Let me just tell you this: is um, the, the danger to a Christian is way worse than Somalia. Ninety nine, I think, is like ninety nine point three percent fundamentally Islam and some other little religions that that are in there. But it's primarily uh, an Islamic country. There's obviously there's some. There's some Hindu and some, some Buddhist um, flavors in there, but it's, it's, it's primarily that. There are 500 pastors that are in, Bang, in Bangladesh, 500. And 400 of them are coming to this conference that we're putting together. So on your behalf, we will be there speaking into the lives. We're gonna, I'm gonna have three and a half days with these guys pouring life and truth and God's, God's encouragement. We're gonna pray over them and impart things and ask God just to, just to bless them in Jesus' mighty name. And it's gonna be an amazing time. And then we're gonna be holding miracle services. In fact, their Sunday services are actually held on Friday there because in the, the Muslim religion, they meet on Sunday, so they're not able to, they're not able to meet. And so, We'll be ministering in services on that Friday. And I'm just going to ask you to pray for me. And we got a small little team that's going for God's protection on, on our lives and, <laughs> and what we're going to eat and, uh, <laughs> and, and the drain on us because like I'm, like, it's like a lot of speaking. It's a lot. And so just I need you guys to pray, pray with me. And then just please know this. I, I can't post anything on my social media accounts. So... Like, I'll, I'll post pictures of like, hey, this is what India looks like, and here's some things, but I can't post pictures really of the services for um, security purposes, security. Now, we'll be able to share some things when we come back, but I can't do it while I'm there because of really more so my security and then some of the guys, some of the people, especially in Bangladesh, of where, where they're at because these things get monitored. And so uh, if I'm posting something out there, just know, hey, you, you might see something and go, what's he doing there? Is he doing any ministry? Oh, yeah. There's gonna be, y'all just pray for me. All right? And then when I come back, I can't wait to share with you guys all the cool things. All right? Cool. All right, guys. By the way, we'll be ministering to probably about 100 to 150,000 people during that time. Okay? So it's going to be a powerful time. It's going to be amazing. Come on, everybody. Stand to your feet. On this Mother's Day, Lord, bless you and keep you, Lord. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you, everybody. God bless you.